Hi, this is Zara Fuzzle, the voice of Halo, and you're listening to Whelmed, The Young Justice Files. Recognized, Uncle Walker, D, zero, one. Recognized, Halo, G, zero, three. Hello, team. Today in the Watchtower, we welcome one of the newest members of the Young Justice team, Sarah Fuzzle. Sarah's career stretches back a decade and includes work in live-action shows like How to Get Away with Murder and as the voice of the computer in Netflix's Lost in Space, voice work in video games like Titanfall 2, League of Legends, and the newly announced Apex Legends, and animated productions like Adam Ruins Everything, Voltron Legendary Defender, and of course, as the voices of Harper Rowe, Cassandra Savage, and Halo in Young Justice Outsiders. Sarah, we are honored to welcome you to Whelmed. Hi, Rich. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> you are very welcome. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that our discussion episodes draw on anything and everything related to Young Justice, including up to episode 13 of season three, the comics and the video game. If you've not seen, read, or played all the material and are spoiler wary, please consider this your warning. And with all that out of the way, let's dive in. I've been looking forward to this since Comic-Con. Oh my gosh, me too. We like, met at, we met first at Comic-Con uh, up in the little Warner Brothers loft. loft. Yes, the swanky VIP loft. Uh, yeah, the swanky, <laughs> exactly. Uh, and we said, I was like, oh my gosh, let's sit down and chat for a minute. And then uh, you just started saying amazing things. And I was like, stop talking, save it for the podcast. <laughs> We're going to just get you on the show. It's There's too much. Uh, so I touched on a few things in the intro here, but tell us more about who you are and what you do in the world. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Well, I guess I can start at the very beginning. I uh, grew up in Indiana, was born in Illinois, grew up in Indiana. And um, was Wait, absolutely- where, in, where in Indiana, may I ask? Yeah, uh, West Lafayette, where Purdue University is. Oh, I grew, up in, I grew up in Kentucky, right across the river, oh, Ohio river from- Neighbor Evan, to the south. Evansville, Indiana, if you know where that is. Uh, yes. To the south, yes, that's where I grew up. Sorry, oh, I got cool. you. I let you go about 10 seconds, then I interrupted you, so- No, I love it. Midwest, you, right. Wait, is Kentucky <laughs> considered part of the Midwest or is it the south? It is uh, considered nothing. Most people forget <laughs> it even exists, I think. Uh, I tell people I'm from Kentucky. The first thing they ask me is, "What's it like in Tennessee?" Oh, and I say, "I don't know." No. I, I literally, I literally just told you I'm from Kentucky, not Tennessee, and they're like, "Oh, sorry." I, that's happened to me probably ten times. I don't oh, know. People no. just, unless it's chicken, and the people just don't remember anything about Kentucky. I don't. That's mean. sad because to me, as a Indiana girl, a Hoosier girl, like Kentucky is so present because you know I had this map of the United States that was a puzzle, and uh -huh. I remembered the Kentucky piece fit perfectly right up against the, yeah. the slant of the Indiana piece, <laughs> right, I'm like, right oh, along Kentucky. the Ohio River. Yes, exactly. <laughs> now it's a, beautiful, it's a beautiful, beautiful countryside uh, all through there. It's it's amazing, but for some reason, people just do not. People where I'm at in California do not know where it is. I oh, don't know. Man. It's very strange. Anyway. Back to Indiana. Yes, yes. So West Lafayette, um, it was a small town, but it had a big, with Purdue there, it had a huge floating population. Oh, sure, yeah. So I kind of kind of got the best of both worlds. It was a very suburban, rural upbringing. My high school, I could, I'd see, it was like a mile down the road, and there were a bunch of cornfields and cows <laughs> in between. And... <laughs> I'm having flashbacks to childhood. Go totally. Ahead. <laughs> and uh, so I grew up there. And uh, was obsessed with animation cartoons all through growing up. I actually wanted right. to be an animator. Okay. I wanted to be, I was really into comics. And uh, yeah, then went on to, I went to school outside of uh, Boston. I went to Wellesley College for my undergrad and very quickly discovered that I preferred the performative aspect of storytelling as an actor rather than the the visual as um, an artist. And so right. I, I kind of, I knew storytelling was something I always wanted to do and, and have in my life, but the medium through which I would do it kind of changed over the years. Right. I have to sidetrack you a little bit because there was something, <laughs> something that you sent me that fascinates me. You speak Japanese? I do. I majored you, in it. <laughs> you you majored in Japanese and you interned at the Tokyo Broadcasting Station and the uh, 
Takarazuka Review Company? Yeah, the Takarazuka Review Company. Takarazuka. Um, Sorry, my Japanese is minimal at best. So, uh, no, yeah. no worries. Ta- uh, let, I, I got to know about this. You also worked at the Japanese Embassy in Washington, D.C. There's story. What? There is definitely stories here. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, my relationship with Japan and Japanese goes back a while. So, you know, being super into animation as a kid, oh, I was yeah. also super into anime. <laughs> <laughs> I was like right. one of the original Pokemon watchers and I like right. ran a Pokemon website in high school. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. Dedicated to Team Rocket. Um, <laughs> nice. Hashtag Team Rocket. <laughs> Hashtag Team Rocket forever. And so that, it, like I studied French in high school. So when I started college, I didn't really want to take more French. I was, and since I have this interest in anime, I'm like, oh, I want to study Japanese. Seems interesting. Okay. So I can better understand the cartoons I'm watching or the animated series I'm watching. Sure. And uh, I started taking Japanese and I just fell in love with the language, yeah. with the the Japanese department. I had awesome professors at Wellesley and uh, I really fell in love with Japanese theater. Okay. And like, you know, a lot of people, I think when they're drawn to Japanese anime or J-pop might be the first thing that takes you there. Okay. So my experience was a little different in that, well, anime did take me there, but it was like classical Japanese theater that got me to stay. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I, in particular, became fascinated with the Takarazuka Review Company, which, if folks haven't heard of it, it's about a, it's a little over 100 years old. It's Japan's all-female musical theater that's sort of a foil to kabuki, which is all male. Right. And it started in, um, you know, 1914 as there was the magnate of the Hankyu Railway in Japan wanted to create a place where people could go and Takarazuka City had this spa. And he wanted people to take the railway to Takarazuka City to enjoy the spa. So he founded this review company of female performers as a draw, like hoping people would come see, you know, see the girls, stay for the spa. Right. (laughs) But like it was the history of it. It's like fascinating because they took the, the review style from France, which we associate with like Moulin Rouge or here in the right. US, we associate with like Vegas showgirls. But in right. Japan, the review became almost sanitized and stripped of its sexuality. And okay. it became a representation of, you know, these young women were seen as the epitome of maidenhood and purity and goodness and virtue. Okay. Yeah, it's fascinating. And wow. so that's sort of the the soup in which it was born and then over the years, it transformed, you know, through wartime and then post-war, it transformed into Japan's like top grossing, grossing theater company, producing original musicals, but also adapting stuff from Broadway and international musicals and like the sold out shows seven days a week. Um, wow. Every day in Japan, there's a Takarazuka performance going on somewhere. Um, at one of their theaters. It's, it's, it's fascinating. And, you know, I could spend a whole hour talking to you about it. I did my thesis on it. Oh, wow. I am, I'm floored. So you, I, I, you translated uh, also and staged uh, one of the musicals? Yes. So their most famous musical, one of their most famous musicals was uh, a musical adaptation of the Japanese manga, The Rose of Versailles. And it was the aesthetics of Takarazuka were informed by Japanese comic books. And in turn, Japanese comic books were inspired by, you know, the shoujo style of of manga was inspired by Takarazuka visuals. So it was this kind of feedback loop. (laughs) Um, But the Rose of Versailles kind of put Takarazuka on the map in the 1970s after the war, post-war kind of recession. And there's been multiple stagings of it over the years. They just had an anniversary concert, like going on right now, actually. I think it just closed in Tokyo. So I was fascinated by it. I got an internship at Takarazuka through help of my school and through other programs to work with them for the summer and learn everything I could about all aspects of how they put together their productions. And at the same time, I was gathering there's so many different versions of the Rose of Versailles they've done over the years. So okay. I got a couple different scripts and I translated them and sort of adapted them into um, one show that I then returned to Wellesley for my senior year and staged, directed, cast. It was so much fun. <laughs> I'm I'm just flabbergasted about this whole story. It's incredible. And this this idea... This is the thing that that shocked me when I first moved out of small town Kentucky and moved to Orange County. 
I the only thing I knew about any kind of anime was Battle of the Planets that I loved, but was very badly translated, and like a little bit of like um oh gosh, what am I thinking? It wasn't Gundam. It was uh it was something they, we just had these American versions of a few things that had come over, and I uh-huh. in in the eighties nineteen eighty eight I moved to Southern California, and I remember I walked into this new friend of mine's house, and they were watching a cartoon. I walked in and I'm like, oh, cartoons. And they all turned and gave me the nastiest look. And then I sat down in the chair and it was, it was, it was the Giver. Have you ever seen the Giver, the original Giver? No. So it's about a, it's about a bioengineered battle suit that finds a host on earth, right? The very first scene I sit down to watch, the Giver divides like 12 people in half. Oh my gosh. And there's bodies everywhere. And I was like, what is happening right now? I did not understand anything about anything. And that was the first time I got introduced, uh, <laughs> a little less graphically, but to this idea <laughs> that what I grew up with around Americanized comics, the Comics Code Authority being yes. a filter, right? Uh, American style animation was not the only way that things work. Right. And that and that comics, though seen in the in the States, is kind of something for younger people and it's it's a kid's thing that you grow out of and whatever. Right. Um, Which is, is so is unfortunate. A highly respected form of storytelling like that we get more today, that people have a lot more respect for it today than before. Absolutely. And hearing hearing you talking about how like the stage performances were informed by manga and how manga were influenced by theater stage performance. I was just like, Oh gosh, I just, I love it. I love that, that idea that um, the art, uh, the art continues to inspire each other in different styles of art. Yes. Yes. And that's what I find is so fascinating. I mean, that's what really, I think draws me to Japanese art theater and culture in general is that, I feel like, and there's many reasons culturally that feed into this, but Japan is sort of a master of taking ideas that exist and then innovating upon them further to then evolve them into something completely new. And you see this in business practices. You see this constantly in the arts. You see this. And I think part of it is the nature of it's an island that faces many earthquakes and so things are leveled and rebuilt and leveled and rebuilt and leveled and rebuilt. And you look at it in its historical context of, you know, going from isolated to an imperial power to then being decimated in World War II. So it's, it's things being built and leveled, built and leveled. And I think that does huh. something that affects the artistic culture of a culture. This right. process of, okay, here's this thing and we're going to build it into something else. And who knows what that next thing might be. I don't know. It's all very fascinating to me. No, I, I agree with you. But there's also this this sense of deep, rich sense of historical culture, but without like like honoring some of that culture while not um, being stuck in it. Like yeah. this somehow this ability to balance this idea like, yes, there's a restaurant that's been there for a thousand years, right? Or there's an right. honoring of certain traditions, yet that there's no reason why we can't make some of the most advanced technology in the world as well. Like you, you can balance yes. those things without being stuck in that, uh, that older mindset in some way. There's some weird balance yeah. there. Now I'm not, I mean, I also have a fascination with Japanese culture. I've studied Japanese minimally, um, but I studied it out of curiosity and um, the spirituality of Shinto and so on and so forth. Those are kind of my approaches, but there's these things that you're verbalizing that I'm kind of grasping onto. Um, Aikido is a martial art that I study and Aikido is not a very old martial art, but it is an incorporation of other arts, other martial arts that are combined together and created something new to create a, based on a philosophy. So like, it's kind of that same kind of idea. There you go. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. I'm so fascinated. Okay. So, okay. 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 Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Okay. 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 All right, so we're doing you, a Japanese so, culture so podcast, made, right? It's yes, this is today. welcome to Whelmed. We're everywhere. Um, <laughs> so, all right, so you go and you study Japanese. You have a degree yeah. in Japanese. I sure okay. do. <laughs> okay, there's a story there from this from Japanese to voice acting and to the storytelling aspects and so on and so forth. Right? Did you sure. do stage productions outside of this and it got translated? I, I understand. Let I, me, you let and me I backtrack. Talk- okay. Okay. Do that. <laughs> so 
all throughout my childhood, I was involved in plays and speech and debate was kind of my main thing all through middle school and high school. I okay. loved giving speeches. I loved doing dramatic interp, humorous interp, original oratory where you'd write your own speech. I did both Lincoln Douglas debate and policy debate for you debate nerds out there. Like I was all about that. And I did the school play and I did the school musicals. So I was always very much about performing and acting, but I don't think I really started to think of it as a career, op- a bil- um, as the opportunity to have a career out of it. Like I'm mm-hmm. from a South Asian family. My parents were born in India. They immigrated to Pakistan when they were very young, when the partition was created with Pakistan and India in the 1950s. Right. And um, they were both doctors. So in a lot of what, a lot of times in South Asian culture, going into the arts is just not something that's ever discussed as a viability. It's not top of the list. Not a t- yeah. It's like you have to have financial security, you know, you, so your, your schooling should reflect something that could get you, it should be practical. Uh, right. Now, my parents were a bit of an anomaly and I am so thankful that they were my parents <laughs> because I think for lots of reasons, they were just a lot more open-minded about what was possible in the world for them and for their children and for right. women in particular. I'm one of four sisters and we were all encouraged to follow our passion within reason. <laughs> right. <laughs> and uh, part of it, my dad's family, my dad's side of the family was very much involved in Bollywood in like the golden age in the thirties, yeah. forties and fifties. And wow. um, yeah. I have, you know, family who's, who are still involved in, in, in the business over there. And so I think because of that, he was a little more open-minded about his children exploring their interest in right. performing arts. The success and the joy both that can come from that kind of expression. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think he also had an acute view of the hardships uh, and uh, yeah, so, that makes sense. Yeah, sure. So it was like encouragement, but tinged with caution. <laughs> right, like, right. Go forth, but maybe also get an MBA. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Um, Follow your passion, but do it safely. Yeah. Right. Yes. And, and my mom is really interesting because she was a doctor, but in her heart of hearts, she wanted to be an engineer. But it wasn't really okay. an option for women at that time oh, in Pakistan. Right. And so... I think she, so because of that, she was also very sympathetic to, I want my children to do what they love. Yeah. And she was always so encouraging of, of, uh, I think the quintessential story I tell about my mom to get a sense of her is I was painting on the wall. I was like 12. I was painting a a woman on the wall in my room with these poster paints that I tested and you could wipe them off and there'd be no residue. (laughs) So I was like, but I'm going to go for it. So I painted this wall with this woman and my mom walked in on me. And I, I said, mom, don't worry. I can wash it off. I can wash it off. And she just gasped. And she said, no, do more. Do the whole wall. This is so beautiful. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. And so like I, I attribute so much to my parents for making me feel comfortable in taking those artistic risks. Oh, uh, that's amazing. Yeah. What about your siblings then? You have three sisters? I do, yeah. yeah. So are they, do they, what are, what are they up to? What are they doing? Do they oh follow gosh. artistic or? So um, on Twitter, you, you, you joked that I sent you a list of my accomplishments, professional yeah, yeah. education. You sent me stuff and I expected like voice acting and I got like degrees in Japanese <laughs> and worked at the Japanese embassy. And I was like, I gotta, I gotta get off my butt. I got to do more. I got to go do some more stuff. (laughs) Well, let me put it this way. I'm the least educated out of all of my sisters. (laughs) There are PhDs and MBAs and masters to go around. It's ridiculous. I have um, every, my sisters are geniuses. All of us kind of gravitated towards careers involving language in some way. Like I have a sister who, she's a speech language pathologist. I have another sister who's a professor of education um, and reading acquisition is her her specialty. And then I have another sister who um, is a literal rocket scientist by trade. Nice. But (laughs) in recent years, she's become an actor and she's killing it in New York on TV. Um, Okay. So okay. it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, yeah, we all, uh, we all are very expressive and all about words and communication in some way. Okay. All right. So when I hear that, like I have three siblings as well, we do not do this. Actually, that's not true. M- many of us work in and or around the medical industry. Ah. So there's a commonality there. But when I, when I hear you say something like this about language, I have to ask, 
there's got to be a com like was it your parents that like was it the environment you grew up in was it something that you guys did together as children an experience that you had that in that kind of you feel like might have fed into that idea with the with the communication and linguistics that's a great question i don't think i've ever tried to distill it down to an event or i think part of it honestly you have four young women in a house y'all are talking over each other the whole time <laughs> excitedly okay. trying to sure. get your point across okay so you learn to communicate well because yeah. in order to be heard you have to yeah and i mean i don't know i think again i credit my parents especially my mom she would just provide us with cultural experience after cultural experience taking us to to movies to plays to museums you know right making sure that when we went to a museum, we didn't just breeze through, but we read every placard. Um, right. And so I think her love and enthusiasm for learning and language just naturally trans transmitted to, to us. Huh. Um, and I think also growing up in a bilingual household. Uh, so my parents spoke Hindi and Urdu, which okay. um, are the same language spoken, but are different written, written. Right. And, uh, you know, hearing and speaking different languages, I think, at least for me, gave me an ear. It was why I was able to pick up Japanese relatively easily, even though it's completely different language. Yeah. My ear, and it's why I think I'm, as a voice actor, I, I, I end up getting cast to do a lot of accents, to do a lot of different voices. And I, I think I have a good ear for that. And that's cultivated in a bilingual household. You're just, your, your ear is always ready to, to pick up, to mimic to learn. Right. So you, okay. So how many languages? There was French mentions, Japanese, right? Yeah. Hindi and Urdu. Very, how much, what do you speak? Very how many do you speak? <laughs> I know how to like order stuff at a restaurant in French and I know okay, how, fair how to like very, very basic conversational Hindi or Urdu. Un, deux, trois, quatre, cinq. Right, oui, yeah. Oui. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I got you. <laughs> And um, I wish, I wish my parents had forced me to learn Urdu. Um, so then I would have had a second language, but I don't have a second language. English is my only native language. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Well, I have to, so, all right. So this, I think leads into <laughs> this next thing. You met Greg Weissman early on. Yes, totally. In, now, I was talking with Greg a few weeks ago. And I was talking about like, Greg, you, uh, Halo, you had Sarah in mind for Halo. And he said, yes. And I said, I know you have said to me over and over and over again about how amazing, how amazing Zara is. He's like, yes. I said, then I heard her also as Harper Rowe and Cassandra Savage and had no, I have a good ear, no clue you did the voices for those. And I mentioned that to him and he's like, yeah, I don't just write parts for everyone. <laughs> it's like, oh my goodness! You don't you don't get to be a voice actor of that quality. Like that, there's a reason why she's on the show, and he just said it with just like the the most like straightforward face, like no joke whatsoever. <laughs> oh, now, Greg. when you and I were talking, you had mentioned to me that you had met him because you had been a fan of Gargoyles. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about this story. Totally. Okay. So. I mentioned I was super into animation as a kid and more than, right. I mean, a lot of kids love to watch cartoons. I never grew out of that. I <laughs> loved animation so much. <laughs> Yay. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> um, I was a huge fan. Like the first show I remember really becoming a fan of, and I was, you know, tiny. I was like six years old. was Darkwing Duck. Oh, nice. I love Darkwing Duck so much. I'm actually wearing a Darkwing shirt right now. Nice. <laughs> And awesome. um, that like I was so that I was super into the Disney afternoon and I would mm -hmm. look at the credits even at a young age. I would look at the credits and I would notice the same names popping up for the cast and for the voice direction. And, you know, and so I was right. always kind of fun. It was fun tracking these things like as new shows came on the Disney afternoon, for example, Jim Cummings, who plays Darkwing Duck. Oh, yeah, I was like, course. oh, wait, he's also in Goof Troop as Pete. And oh, wait, he's also in Bonkers as Bonkers and Lucky Pickel. And he's also in this and this and this. And so um, I knew voice actors existed. I knew right. they were people behind the cartoons. Right. And uh, I was fascinated and and 
I loved their work. I loved everything about those Disney cartoons at that time. Gargoyles came on in 1994 and it was so unlike anything else that had been on the Disney afternoon. Or anything else, period. (laughs) Right, right. (laughs) It was this amazing episodic story, this drama. And I very quickly became obsessed. And I loved Elisa Maza, the the main heroine. I mean, here you had this incredible New York City detective, woman of color. She looked like me. I mean, I hadn't seen that really on TV before. Oh, I was just going to say all through my preteen years, I like wore black shirts and and red jackets and blue (laughs) jeans. Before I even knew what cosplay was, I was like, oh, I want to wear my Lisa outfit. (laughs) Nice. You know, I'd have to I'd have to do a little research, but I remember I have a particular scene stuck in my head because it's the episode of Gargoyles that just sticks with me forever. It's the one where Broadway goes to watch a, a Western. Oh, yes. And he comes back and he gets Elisa's gun yes. and he accidentally shoots her. And I was like, I still can't, I haven't seen that episode in probably 15 years and I still tear up thinking about it. But there's a scene later on where she's in the hospital bed and her brother and her parents show up. And I'm, I'm, I'm going off my own, like the visual picture I have in my head right now, but I, her mom was, uh, was African American and yep. her dad was Native American. Yep. Yep. Is that correct? That is correct. Wow. Okay. Um, wow, I'm pr- impressed. Episode, I remember that scene. That's the yeah. first episode I ever saw of Gargoyles. Actually, that's a that's a that's a wow. That's yeah. a big one. <laughs> and um, yeah. it, seeing like a at that time like a biracial couple depicted in animation yep. on TV with no explanation, just that's what it is. It just is. Yes, I love thank that. You. Yes, I mean, what more could you hope for? And what uh what a high i was spoiled i think we were spoiled by that show <laughs> you know yeah. how ahead of its time it was and how yeah. much it didn't explain to you it let you figure it out yourself yeah you think about and that's right around the time we also had like batman the animated series yes. so it was like these things were like there are these there's these key moments in in history for animation and and that was at those few years were absolutely one of them yeah it was incredible so I was a fan of Gargoyles all throughout from then on. And um, I grad- when I graduated high school, my dad, uh, they were having, at that point, it was, t- I don't want to date myself, but it was 2001. And uh, my dad uh, took me to the uh, gathering of the Gargoyles convention. They would have, since 1998 or 99, they had these um, yearly meetups for Gargoyles okay. fans. And so this right. that year, 2001, it was in... Uh, um, Los Angeles, Hollywood, uh, actually Universal City. <laughs> right. And so I really wanted to go. And as a graduation present from high school, my dad took me to it. And that's where I first met Greg. Uh, they do these things, they did these things at these conventions where, and I, I know Greg still does them now, I think at Convergence, um, but it's a yeah. radio play. Yep. Where he brings a script from a show uh, or something he's written for the convention and he'll cast. Uh, members of the uh, the fans amongst yeah, voice actors that are at who the con. Were, yeah. and and so I I went and I auditioned and I got cast as Elisa Maza. That's amazing. <laughs> you can imagine my my heart <laughs> is like exploding with joy. Little sixteen year old <laughs> me, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm playing Elisa, and <laughs> um, and we did it, and it was so great, and uh, we did the 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 radio play live for the for the for the con. And Greg was just the most welcoming, kind creator you could hope to meet. He was so encouraging and supportive and you could tell he was really in his element. Like it was so much fun. He, he yeah. and the st- con staff and the other guests there just created this, this um, atmosphere of fun and friendship. Like you left the convention feeling, Oh, I have like five new best friends. This is incredible. <laughs> and uh, he, he said to me, cause I was about to start college. Um, he said to me, you know, after college, you should think about moving to Los Angeles because I really think you could have a career in, in acting for animation. And I filed that little thing away like, okay, Mr. Weisman. <laughs> That's <laughs> so nice of school, you to say. Right? right. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, over the years then I would, uh, every few years I would be able to go back to a gathering to reconnect with everybody and um, yeah. continue doing these radio plays. and. Then flash forward in the timeline a little bit, 
in in college, I realized I wanted to be an actor. I was focused on stage acting at that time, theater. I moved to Washington, D.C. and did a bunch of regional theater in, in D.C., New York. Kept in touch with Greg. Uh, he actually gave me the opportunity over the years to audition for several of the shows he was working on. I auditioned for Spectacular Spider-Man. Right. Um, I auditioned for uh, Star Wars Rebels. Right. And then you know, it was just the perfect opportunity to work together for this third season of Young Justice, 16 years later <laughs> from when I first, we first met. Well, it, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. Like, we, we've met through this, but it seems to me you've had an explosion of work that has come onto the scene in the last year or two. Yeah. <laughs> like, you were working, you must have been working on stuff for several years and not been able to say anything. And then suddenly you're everywhere. <laughs> it's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah, I moved to LA about seven years ago um, with the focus of working on TV on camera and in animation. Right. And um, things had been going really well. Uh, but in, this, in, this, in the beginning of 2017, like three different things happened at once that kind of got the ball, the snowball rolling down the hill, so to speak. Right. Um, I got cast in Young Justice. About two weeks later, I got cast in Voltron. Right. And then I, um, I got cast in another project at another studio um, that I've continued to get more work at that I can't talk about right now. But uh, those Fair. three things I feel were like all happening at once and then the avalanche went. Right. Which I'm just, you know, I try to analyze it because people ask me like, how did you do it? How does, how does, how did you get into it? And I'm like, I, I, I'm, <laughs> like, I think, I think this, this, these three things happen and the momentum just keeps going. And, you know, then your agents have more to pitch you with and um, you become a known quantity like, oh, she's on this. Then, okay. You become a trustworthy quantity the more you work. Yeah. So yes. I think it just all hit critical mass and then it got going and I'm, I'm so excited and thankful and it's, it's literally, I'm literally living my dream job right now. It's incredible. Yeah. I don't really know what to say much more beyond that about it. <laughs> we're really happy for you. <laughs> Thank you. There is a, uh, you were, how old, can I ask you how old you were at that? I was when you met Greg? 16. 16, you said? Yeah. Okay. I can't help but think that there was something, either you had been doing voices at home or like you had been doing things of your own, like yeah, okay, we we a lot of us were in theater, you know, and, and did productions and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But to go to something like this and have someone like Greg, who has worked with a, numerous voice actors, to say, "No, I see something there," and to have you not major in theater, you know, in college you majored in Japanese. Sure, like there's there's something either. Uh, uh, there's always there's always a natural thing that that you can't necessarily learn that some people have and that's fantastic. But I always feel like there's also something somebody's always doing. There's some to to prepare themselves for something like this. Totally. This didn't this didn't just you didn't just stumble into this. No. Right? You were ready when the opportunities came. How did you get ready for you, your story? Yes, to your point, there is always a natural thing that people have yes the what talent whatever you call it instincts i had good instincts but okay. instincts are nothing if you don't have a yes. discipline and a routine and um there has to be more studying right. all the time yeah so i uh all through college even though i majored in japanese i was never not in a play <laughs> i was okay. always doing gotcha. theater and then when i you know graduated and i lived in I had applied to a couple MFA programs because at that point I thought I wanted to be a musical theater star. And um, <laughs> the MFA programs, the ones I applied to didn't work out. So I went to DC and I started working immediately in, in regional theater. I worked at okay. um, the Kennedy Center, Studio Theater, Cinetic Theater. Um, I'm blanking. I, I, I did a bunch of theater in DC. I did a okay. bunch of children's theater. I just did as many shows as I could possibly humanly do while working a day job. And it was, that was my education. That was my MFA. Gotcha. I was never not acting. <laughs> gotcha. The voiceover thing, I really started to focus on when I moved to Los Angeles. I also had a, a one-woman show. I did a couple one-woman shows that I took all around the country to different festivals. And so I was seeing as much theater as I could too, doing and seeing, you know, 
the one of the shows I did was very comedic. And so I think in preparing for a voiceover career, like a comedy background or comedic acting is it's so important to have that live back and forth to see what lands, yes. you know, see who you are as a performer, what lands about you, what makes your sounds, your right. sounds. What's your to find your voice, to find the voice of you and in, in what registers and yeah. what registers with the audience. Yeah. And to work on different characters, especially, you know, in children's theater, so much of it is such a good training for, for acting for animation. I find, I found. Yeah. So you, you were never not, you were never not participating. You were always constantly. I was always acting. I was always in a show. And if I wasn't in a show, I was in a class. I'm still in an acting class every week. Like I'm never not working on it. Right. And um, but voiceover specifically, when I moved to LA, there were a couple of people who were just like instrumental in helping me kind of learn the ropes here. One was uh, Bill Ratner, who was on uh, GI Joe, and he was also I'm a huge fan of the classic Sierra RPG games, King's Quest series. He was the oh, yeah. narrator in King's Quest Six, <laughs> which is just amazing. And um, your face is making me so happy right now. <laughs> I wish you all could see out there in the podcast first. <laughs> no, but like, uh, so Bill Ratner, I forget how I got in touch with him. I think he was giving a free webinar about voice acting. And he so generously got on the phone with me, gave me an hour of his time and answered all my questions, gave me advice on how to get started. And so I am like so thankful to him. Um, the other people who were just instrumental in me getting situated here in LA and voiceover uh, were Rick Dasher and Mark De La Fuente at what was once North Hollywood Sound. It's now Dave and Dave. They are were just... I started doing an airline radio talk show for Rick that he was producing and he introduced me to all these other people. Let me take classes at his studio. Like it was just help me figure out and have a voiceover home here. So, you know, I'm so there's this community is so giving of, of, of voice actors in Los Angeles and the people who work in, in animation, video games, interactive, all those things. And so I guess my point with all that was, I did theater. I did acting. I've always been focused on that part of it because that's the most important part. But then for like the nitty gritty stuff related to voiceover and business within voiceover, um, there were a lot of people in LA who helped me when I first started. Right. Yeah. So we talk about this this idea. For me, I, I speak of it from a, a writing standpoint. So there's there's the art and then there's the craft. Mm. Right. The art is often the part that people want to do. <laughs> yeah. Because that's the stuff that's like, oh, I want to do the fun stuff, right? The craft is figuring out, okay, if I'm gonna break the rules, I gotta learn what the rules are first. You know, you've gotta be a part of knowing how to tweak and tune and and get perspectives from people who have either done this before or get the experience to be able to figure these things out yourself. Yeah. That's the craft part. And the craft part takes more takes a lot of work. Yeah. And um it's it's participating in that work. Uh, and doing it. It's that whatever that thing is about, like it takes 10,000 hours to master a thing, you know, it's like, yeah. that's the craft part of it. The art part can be more like what you're saying is something that draws you to some creative thing, something that, that gels with you, whether it's music or theater or whatever it happens to be. Yeah. The expression, the desire to express something. Right. You don't become, you don't become as skilled a voice actor as I, as I feel like I can already see you being in Young Justice by just having the art. You've got mm -hmm. to have the craft and do the work for the craft. And with a lot of people, it's, oh, I went to, I got a degree in theater or, you know, that kind of stuff. But when you tell me you don't have a degree in theater, you have like uh, Vanessa Marshall's degree in English. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. and you have a degree in Japanese and like these are, you're, you're going somewhere else and doing something else. And it also tells people that are listening to the show is you can have more than one passion and the more things you participate in you need it, it, more than one passion right right if you were an right. actor all about acting you'd be so boring i'm sorry <laughs> like <laughs> like you need to have a full life with lots of different because all of that is going to inform you who you are as a performer what you bring yes. to your craft and it's <sighs> to look at any to be so myopic about any topic in the world you need balance. 
you need richness and fullness. You need to steep and marinate in life experiences. Like it's just, <laughs> it's important. It's critical for any profession, but especially for acting, I think. Yeah. No, I absolutely agree with you. I think Crispin Freeman and, and he was talking about there was a time when he was doing his acting and his teachers were like, yes, you look nice. You sound nice. Why do I not care? And he oh. was like, oh, that's not good. And then he was understanding that he needed to work on some things for himself, like be himself in some mm. way. Like that's what I got from that conversation with him. And that's kind of what you just didn't stop. You were always doing it. I was always doing it, but um, I feel like I should mention – it's only in retrospect that I realize I was always doing it. I uh, I don't think I mm-hmm. consciously was like, okay, we have to do another play. Okay, we have to do this. Yes. I just kind of followed the yeses and followed what felt right. Yeah. You followed the passion for what you were doing. Yeah, the passion. And uh, I don't know, there's a sense of responsibility that I have sometimes that's sometimes misplaced. <laughs> oh, oh you're digging into that. Unpack that. Well, it's... um I. I think, and I don't think I'm alone in this, I think a lot of us stay in situations longer than we should sometimes, whether Mm -hmm. they're life or work or because we feel like we have to, because we feel there's some kind of unspoken, like, no, I need to tough it out and I need to get through this um, because it's good for me. Even if we don't, hmm, even if it doesn't make us happy or even if it really isn't good or, or it's hard to know when to stop when you've had enough of something. Yeah. Uh, I think I've encountered that over the years and whenever I've been over scheduled, especially with live performance theater stuff, there comes a time where I'm like, you know what? I can afford to say no if something doesn't feel right. Yeah. There's always something to be learned from any experience, but that doesn't mean you have to go do the experience. Yeah. I don't know. That's where I'm at right now. And I think I can, I'm only at that point because I've like, run so hard to get where I am. And now I can look back and be like, okay. Yeah. Now you can be here for a minute. Yeah. And figure out, be more mindful about my approach going forward. Yes. Yeah. So um, you were talking about, I mean, you're speaking of it from professionally, but I think even if we don't have that experience with it professionally, which many of us do, we also have that experience personally. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's a thing about, whether how much you'll stay in a thing until you're done with it. Mm-hmm. And it's been shared with me this idea that you will accept as much a, um, abuse of yourself uh, by other people or situations as you allow yourself to abuse yourself. Oh. <laughs> do you understand what I'm saying? I do. So if you, if you tear yourself up and you're not believing in yourself and that kind of stuff, you will allow other people to abuse you up and up to that point. But once they get past that level yeah. of you abuse of where you'll abuse yourself, you will often say, okay, no, I, I'm done with that. Right. Mm. But it happens. It can, and it can sneak up on you so subtly, both personally, but also professionally, which is really, really important. Right. Totally. And um, it's, if you're not mindful about it, because you can't always be sometimes, you know, your schedule is just so busy sometimes that you can't stop to think about what you're doing. You just have to do it. You have to get through it. Keep doing it. Yeah. And then, you know, I've had moments where some great things have happened professionally. And then at the end of the week, I'm just exhausted emotionally. I feel empty. And I'm like, why, why do I feel this? Why is my bucket not full? Where did I spill it all out on? (laughs) Right. And what can I do to like fill my bucket a little bit again? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, you know, especially when your profession is, I mean, and this isn't just about in acting. I think about what you do, your hospice work. I imagine Mm. you bring so much of yourself to that job. Or do you feel that way? Um, Well, thanks for inviting me on the show uh, and I'll uh, (laughs) (laughs) answering questions. Yeah. When I worked in the ICU, I felt like I brought a lot of myself to the ICU Mm. But in hospice, for some reason, this is my jam. So like, I don't feel like I have to put my face on to go to work. I just get up and I get to go to work. Wow. Like I get to do that job. That doesn't mean that I don't come home tired. And it doesn't mean that I don't have days where something gets me. Sure. But yeah, like you, and when that's happening, I have to look at not just my job, but what else is happening in my life. Because it's probably partly the job and partly other things. (laughs) Mm. Like maybe I'm, maybe I'm, maybe I'm overworking myself with all my creative projects and I'm not taking a break or 
I'm running from work to my kids to help my wife to do, you know, this. And then I've got all these recordings and then I'm just not giving myself any time. Like you're saying, you just keep Mm -hmm. moving forward because part of you is like, okay, well, I get to do these things. These are amazing. I'm going to keep doing them because if I stop, maybe they'll stop forever and I don't want that to happen. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. And you keep moving forward. But sometimes you have to take a step back and and let yourself get that break if you're going to be working on a lot of different projects or even one project intensely. Totally. And you have to trust that. I think especially, you know, the artist's mindset, the creative mindset is I struggled for so long to get where I am. So if I stop, it's all going to go away and it'll all have been for nothing. I think you have to cultivate that trust that whatever you've built, it's going to be there. If you take a day off, you can go right back to it. And you know, now I think about it, I think this really feeds into the concept of imposter syndrome. Uh, So like the faking it till you make it like, mm -hmm. oh, I really love doing this thing. People seem to think I'm, I belong here. So I'm going to keep pretending like I belong here because I want to be until someone finds out that I don't belong here. Mm. Right. And then because, so you keep working and working and working and sometimes you arrive at some place. This happens in just even in nursing, not just a creative endeavor Mm. that they, the, the first year of a nurse you are you it's absolute 100% imposter syndrome you're working around people who know really? so much more than you do and have so much more experience particularly working in something like an ICU like I did people running off to manage codes and saving lives and it's just like i i mean i was 40 you know i was almost 40 when i got back in when i went into this particular area of medicine in nursing wow and I, I feel like I had a lot of world experience and I'm like walking into this going like, well, I got another bachelor's degree and I still don't know garbage <laughs> while I'm in here. And so you have to kind of be there and own it. And one of my managers just constantly was reiterating to us, like all of the new nurses, how no matter what age we were, it was just like, you have to allow yourself to believe that you really do believe be, you belong here. Wow. And for creative endeavors, it's the same thing, right? So in, in role-playing game industry where I do a lot of writing, I did a lot of that as well and fought imposter syndrome and still do periodically, mm. guesting on podcasts for whatever. But the same thing happens with acting. And I've heard it from other actors before. Is this something that you've experienced? That's a great question. First of all, I just have to say I have so much respect and admiration for the work you do. I think you're an angel on earth. Um, oh. I have family members in hospice care. And it was those hospice workers, I remember, were the positive part of that experience and how much they comforted us and comforted my family. Like it, you know, so I am in awe of what you do. You're a superhero. Like you're amazing. Thank you. Second, to answer your question about the imposter syndrome, here are my thoughts on that. I think, yes, it's inevitable that it comes up, that doubts come up that like, oh my gosh, what am I doing here? But One, I think that having that occasional feeling where it doesn't control you, but occasionally you feel that way is good because it means you're humble yes. and it means you're human and it means you're always open to learning and growing yes. and you realize yes. there's no apex that you've reached. You're always, oh, there's always more to do. Um, there's more to well learn, said. more to grow. Mm-hmm. And I think for me, I've been asked, like, how did you know? you could do this? How did you know you could do voices or be a voice actor or work? Like, how did you know? Or that's what you wanted? Or I can't really, you know, I can logically tell you all the things that led me to this path and, you know, tell you all the people I encountered who helped facilitate it. But at the end of the day, the urge to be an actor and the knowledge that I'd be successful at it as a living was just an inherent belief that I just have. I've always had it. Wow. Yeah. And it's weird because I I don't know where that came from other than this sense of like, oh, this is your destiny. Like, yeah, of course you're going to do this. And you know, I, again, I, I bring up Chrisman again. He had made this thing like in retrospect, he was like, oh, in retrospect, I was like, well, of course this was what I was supposed to do. Mm, yeah. <laughs> like no doubts. But it sounds like um, it sounds like when I do that and look back and go, yes, this is an inevitable thing that would have happened to me. Didn't feel like that at the time. Feels sure. like it seems like it felt like it to you the whole that you you were at one with that the whole time that that was happening or most. of the time. That was yeah, happening. most of the time. And not to say that like. I think that idea was cultivated and planted by a lot of support when I was a kid. Obviously, Greg Wiseman giving me that seed at age yeah, 16. That's not of, nothing. No, that's not <laughs> nothing. That that was like an inherent like, oh, 
someone from that world has given me a stamp of approval. So I know yeah. that this is a possibility. Like I, huh. that, that is no small thing. No. But I think, you know, regardless of whether I would have been in animation or not, I would have been an actor no matter what. And that, that kind of have to do it, have to do it. It has to happen. It's going to happen. I encourage anyone who's considering going into acting to honestly assess if you have that belief about yourself or not. And it's, it's, it's either there or it's not. I think mm. that for me, that's been a crucial part of, it's been the light when things have been dark is just this belief in myself in that way. Yeah. And so can I ask for a clarification? Mm -hmm. Is it, is it, is it that you knew that acting or voice acting was going to always be the thing? Or is it that you just believed that it will work out the way it needs to work out? However, wherever I end, do you know what I mean? Yes. This, co this confidence that it's like, I don't know exactly what this looks like, but I know it's going, if I follow my path and I follow this energy that I'm putting into this, that I will end up someplace that I'm going to be happy and it's going to be good. Or was it, no, I know I'm going to be voice acting on Greg Weissman's show someday, like that specific. Do you know what I mean? I would describe it as I see a certain level and body of work that I see is possible and I know I belong there. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, and I, 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 it's hard to articulate into words because it feels... It's not arrogance in me. It's, it's not, it's not, um, it's it not. It could a, be, and it's not. I know, I get it's not. It's just a faith. I don't know. <laughs> That's what it is. Yeah. It's just a, it's a faith and a center, centeredness and a having, having a groundedness or a foundation and being safe in that groundedness or foundation to some extent. Yeah. I, not everybody gets that. And I'm glad that, I'm glad that you have that and that it became so clear to you because it's really clear to me. Like you, you, every time I see you in some place, we ran into you at the DC daily that one day. Yeah. And every time I see you, I'm just like, you are where you're, you are a person who is where they're supposed to be. <laughs> Thank you. It's every time I turn around, I'm just like, wow, you just, you're just belong here. Thank you so much. Which isn't to say that like, I'm like, I, I would wake up every morning with that faith and I'm like, yeah. And I never have a bad day. That's not true at all. <laughs> no, I'm constantly sure. doubting and guessing myself and always like, you know, the curse of ambition is like, okay, I achieved this. Now what's the next thing? Oh, okay. Right. You, I got move, that. What's that? <laughs> you move the bar. <laughs> you're like, oh, I reached that bar. The, the, the bar's moved. Okay. Now new bar. And it's like, just relax and have the faith that, and then the, I think the second, the, I forget what, when you said it, but the, the, the faith that, Hey, you can't control where it's going to go. You can't control what it's going to look like, but right. yeah, keep following it and it will lead somewhere good. That comes into play too. I love it. But, uh, I, I actually do have a question related to Halo. We haven't yeah. talked that much about Halo, the character. Um, and that's okay. Cause this is why we got you on the show, like to talk about lots of aspects of you. We want to know mm. not just who you are, but why you are. And you've been sharing that. And we really appreciate that. But we did have a question that I want to get to before we wrap up. And that is Halo evolves it pretty quickly over a few episodes, socially, intellectually, emotionally, like she becomes like she's, you have the first three episodes I think she's in feels like three completely different kinds of characters. Totally. And evolves in those spaces. And I saw your interview on DC Daily where you said like the first, the first episode she had aligned was your first day of work. Uh -huh. And in that episode, there isn't much line <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> going on. And that character is very different from who we see her in by episode 13. Can right. you talk about that change? Like what you knew about Halo and, and that character and how you were going to work with that yes. evolution? So like, first off, off the bat, Greg and Brandon are, you could not ask for better people to work with, creative collaborators. They're geniuses. You know this. Everyone who listens to this podcast knows this. They're <laughs> just the best. That whole thing we were talking about earlier about art and craft and you do the craft so you can get to the art. Their yes. writing is the art. It's just as an actor, it's amazing to work on their stuff. I can't thank them enough for doing what they do and bringing me on board. Like It's just amazing. To give me this responsibility of Halo, this character who goes through so much and has yet to further go through, it was an interesting challenge. It was a little intimidating, 
so on the first day of recording, all I knew was that I'd be playing a character named Halo. She's a teenager. She's a Middle Eastern teenager. She might have an accent. And uh, she's based on Halo in the Outsiders comics. Mm. So I was like, okay. So I, I, I read everything I could about Halo in the Outsiders comics and come to my first day. And that's when Greg shows me the art, uh, the character design for Halo. She's not a blonde white woman? No, no, surprisingly <laughs> not. And, you know, we talked about having the accent and we talked about making her younger than my natural sound. And I knew on that first day that she was a mother box in the okay. body of a teenage girl. And okay. over the course of the season, this is the analogy I threw out. I'm not sure if it's the perfect metaphor, but at the time it was my like, oh, she's kind of like Data from Star Trek The Next Generation, where right. she, she learns about feelings um, yeah. and becomes a real boy. No, um, And so I thought, okay, okay, there's that element of human in her, but there's that very present element of alien machine. Yeah. And intellectually, it's, um, I play a lot of robots in, in some of my other work. I do a lot of emotionless <laughs> AI, <laughs> right? Like Lost in Space, a lot of right. work. I'm like the AI. I have that soothing tone that sort of is devoid of emotion. Um, and like that, I, I knew that if I leaned too much into the alien roboticness of her, first of all, that's not what they wanted. And, and second, that's, that didn't right. feel right. I see right. Halo as like, a metaphor for what it is to be a teenager. You are accustomed to one way of living and then puberty strikes and all these hormones <laughs> and emotions start flowing and all these new experiences happen and, and things happen. And it's so intense. Every Everything happens. Like each year is like a volume of uh, events that occurs to you and, and um, you grow so much year to year. So in thinking about Halo, I think I think she's a metaphor for the teenage experience in that way because you very quickly have to come to grasp with who am I to myself and who am I to others, yeah. um, which I think we all wrestle with well into well past adolescence. Yeah. So I think this idea of what I wanted, what I what I thought she was all about was this openness to the new world that she's in trying to reconcile things from her past with, with things in her present, the people around her who evoke different responses from her, whether those responses are to nurture, to, to flirt, whatever those things that are coming out about her personality, the th people who come in her way who might challenge. It's hard to really be articulate about it without giving too much away, Rich. <laughs> That's okay. We don't want to spoil anything. No, I don't want to spoil anything. Um, all I'll but let's talk. Let's talk about some of the things that you've already brought up. Remind yeah. me of specific scenes from the show. Yes. So um, the scene, the scene where Halo, where when when Young Justice becomes a horror movie. Yes. Where uh, Cyborg is coming after Halo in the house, but at the end when she says something to the effect of, "I don't know what all of this feel, uh, what all of this is." Yes. But I know what I am is enough. Yes. You Feels know, like that that analogy you're talking about, about that trying to get through those teenage years and saying, I don't know what's yes. happening to me, but I'm enough. 100%. 100%. So I think she says something like, um, all these feelings, they they might be seen as too much, but I think I have all I need. I think that's it. my strength, yeah, yeah. essentially. Right. Like, I love that so much because one, it says you are the way you are now. No, nothing more, nothing less. You are perfectly equipped to help other people in this life. You yeah. are can be there for others in need. You can be a superhero, and I think it also, you know, as a as a as a woman, I think often as women we're sometimes told, "Oh, you're too much. You're too emotional. You're too hysterical. You're you're you you know you express anything to an extreme, and and people view you as oh she's unstable." It's like no, no, no. It's not that you have too much. That's not the problem. That too much about you is fine and it's good. And like, yeah, you are good the way you are. It matters to me because I am a guy mm. who anybody who's listened to any of our episodes knows is extremely emotional mm -hmm. and has had to come to a place 
where I had to be unapologetic for it and forget you guys. I'm going to be who I am. But I did being particularly a male in the South ah. did, did not go over well <laughs> in a lot of cases, which actually led gotcha. to a lot of a lot of depression for me. And having to push all those things down, and and I'll be I'll be honest, near su- near suicidal depression mm. because of that, and uh, to hear that mattered to me too. It's going to matter to a lot of people, I think. That's amazing. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, yeah, hats off to to Kevin Hops, who I think penned that <laughs> I episode. Know, right? I mean, I feel like as a culture in America, we do such a disservice to our men, our young men. Um, in not in and cur- women, I'm sorry, and women, to we do a disservice to everybody. <laughs> but you know, in thinking about <laughs> young men, get so many conflicting messages about what it is to be a man in society, and same, same with women, same with everybody. We have a long way to go, but I'm that means so much to me that I'm 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 so happy I get to play a character who I feel has um, a lot of impact. What she says has has a lot of impact and influence on people watching. Yeah, it's really special. Another scene that jumped out at me was the one where um, Forager first arrives. Uh huh. And not just not just Halo. And I think it's I think it's important actually in this scene that it wasn't just Halo who was just like, "Have you tried apples?" Like as soon as he showed up, just accepting him as a being. Yeah. But that it was also Brion because we know that there's something about Halo where she we didn't know at that time, but we were like, she has this amnesia. She maybe has not been, she doesn't remember being as hurt by the world as she maybe, maybe she was, or, you know, there's something innocent about her. But when you do that and you see that Brion is also like in a reflection of Halo, also seeing in Halo her acceptance of Forager yeah. and being able to be in that space with him and say, hey, I'm in exile as well. You can almost see like just Halo existing in that space and being her in that space is affecting how that team is already bonding together. That's an amazing observation. I, I never really thought of it that way. When I first saw that scene or you know read it, uh, it it's funny because you know Brion pointing out Oh, you're an alien. It kind of reminded me of questions I get all the time of, where are you from, Uh, Indiana? No, where are you really from? Where are you really from? What country? And it's like, dude, are you asking what's my ethnic background? Like, don't other- Find the right question. Find the right Right. question. And I know it's often out of curiosity. It's not out of malice, but those little microaggressions wear on you over time as a person who's not white. Or a yeah. person who's different in some way, and so when yeah. when Brion asks makes a big deal about Forager being an alien, you look like an alien. It's like oh, cringe, cringe, cringe. <laughs> but then, but then you realize he's like, where I'm in exile too. Like then you see them really connect and him really bring him into the fray. And I think that is just so such a great scene because it encapsulates both aspects of that quest of those exchanges, the awkwardness of those exchanges. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then later on, Brion, we only see him as kind of a rage monster there for a while. And then, um, of course, he's the one who hugs Forager even when he's gross and has no yeah. shell. Oh, and, that's uh, right. you know, seeing some examples in the show of you know, non-toxic masculine s- stuff, like seeing yeah. Superboy being, no one doubts Superboy's a man. No, but you know no, what I mean. Sorry, but Bob. but his uh, <laughs> <laughs> hello. But uh, his the whole thing about him, he's grown into a a man who fixes broken things. You know, yeah. like that kind of thing. I'm just like, oh, and the the healthiness of the relationship that I'm seeing, like like um, McGann and Connor have difficulties in the relationship, but you see them here talking to each other and listening to each other, yeah. and trying to work things out. I don't I think we I think as writers we often lean into the tropes a little too easily that drama can only come from the lying and deceit and other things and then it becomes like this self-referential thing about relationships being being difficult in all these ways that we make difficult ourselves. Yeah. And it's nice to see things like characters like Halo, just like the scene with her and Artemis where she's just like I wear it, I wear the hijab because it, I love it just feels scene. right. You know, it just feels right. And it's like, is that okay? And it's like, it's, of course it's okay. Yeah. And then just moving on. <laughs> right. Right. Like, right. And again, nothing is fed or explained to you in a way that makes you feel demeaned or talked down to. It's just, this is what it is. And we're moving on. Yeah. And um, I admire that so much about the writing of this show and the creation of these characters. It's, it's, um, 
it doesn't lean into any trope. It, you know, gosh, it's, it sounds like I'm just gushing, but I really love the characters in this show. They're so interesting. And especially as watchers from season from the beginning, you see the growth of each over time and they feel like real people that you know that would hope like in life grow alongside. Nobody's stuck in their stuff. It's really beautiful to see characters, especially in an animated series, an animated superhero series, have such emotional depth and growth. Yeah, and change. Yeah. I was going to ask you, like, well, what do you what do you picture for Halo in her change in the future? But I don't think you may be able to talk about that because we still have 13 episodes to go in yeah, this season. Totally. So <laughs> totally, totally, totally. Um I'm going to filter myself on the questions. <laughs> I yeah. will say I uh I also really enjoyed the messaging of um the another freak episode. Yeah. With uh, when Halo and Forager go to school and meet Harbor Row and then meet Cyborg. Like that episode too. Uh, like I think about teenage me and how teenage me would have loved that episode too. Yeah, me too. Uh-huh. Uh, it's that messaging of, hey, you're not alone. You're fine the way you are. <laughs> Harper, just keep going. I just love those two. Yeah. I'm loving those two. <laughs> Oh, and (laughs) so the last question I want to ask you before we wrap up here, that scene right there, Mm. uh, you're talking to yourself yeah, in half of that stuff, which cracks me up anytime we see like the whole Crispin Freeman episode where it's just him all day long. (laughs) So good. So I'm assuming you, you, you recorded each character's lines separately. Yes. And then how did I, or not your, how did this process work? You're, I I am blanking a little bit because it was it's been a while. It was a couple of years ago now, but typically in scenes like that where I'm playing two characters who are having a conversation with each other, mm-hmm. I might do a first pass where I go back and forth myself in the voice uh, because okay. you want to play the flow of the scene. Sure, sounds hard, but yes, I get it. <laughs> but then. Uh, we go back and we get a clean pass of each and get alts on each. So gotcha. yeah, I always prefer the first take because the first the first take to get it all out in the sequence that it's in, um, because that to me feels most authentic. It's following your first instincts, that first pass. Right. And then going back and getting anything that needs to be filled in a little bit more individually. Right. Uh, you can't always do that, but some scenes right. need it. Some scenes need that. That particular scene, it was just me, I think. I don't think Jason was there. Um, Jason Spizak, who plays Forager. So can I talk a little bit about like just how awesome record sessions were for Young Justice? Yeah. Like that group of actors is just amazing. And like I recorded mostly sometimes I was alone. Oh, I wanted to talk to you about the recording of Evolution. Oof. I wanted to absolutely talk all about Evolution. I love that episode. It's so good. It's so good. That episode is one of the best things I've ever seen. <laughs> I so uh, it on so many different levels for so many different reasons, spe- especially for like a twenty-six minute episode in the middle of a season of a show. How did that? <laughs> I don't know. Did you get affected by this? Like when you read it and understood what was happening? Like, tell us about that. Yeah, it was. Um... It was an emotional episode to record for a few different reasons. Uh, first of all, Brandon Vietti is a genius. And um, I believe it was his idea that I try Cassandra Savage. Oh. Yeah. So I remember getting the episode to record and that I'd be playing Cassandra. And it was like 67 lines. Cassandra Savage. I'm like, wait, 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 what? Like, this is, and the whole thing is her narrative. It took two, two or three different occasions to record the whole thing through. And I remember when we were first trying to find that voice for her narration, I would, I would, you know, I started one place and then Jamie Thomas and our voice director would layer something else on it and then it would change a little bit and then he'd layer something else on it and then it became this haunted thing yes. that like Greg, I think had stepped out to the bathroom or somewhere like uh, at the beginning from the beginning of the session. And then when he came back in, he told me like, Oh my gosh, you were in such a different place. than when we started, (laughs) it was, yeah, yeah. I was like, Oh, it's all Jamie. And it was not all Jamie. (laughs) It's It's definitely some Jamie, 
<laughs> yes, for sure. Um, but I, I felt the sense of responsibility that they had gifted me with to play Cassandra and to tell this story. And that was, that was absolutely incredible. The episode itself to just what we go through, what we experience seeing Olympia's neck snap at the end was just, uh, you know, <laughs> and I do. And just, I was so emotional at the end of that record session because I felt like, gosh, we, we created this really cool thing together. And I, I just felt so, thankful to be a part of it in the way that I was a part of it and that, you know, to be trusted by the team to, to tell this story. It was yeah. just so special. It was so, so, so special. Yeah. It's an, it's just an incredible piece of art and thank you for your part in it. Thank you. Yeah. All right. On that um, sad note, <laughs> <laughs> sad, but, but appreciative note. <laughs> We've got to wrap things up. We're going to have to have you back to talk even more, uh, maybe totally. after the second half of the season. Oh that my would gosh, be fantastic. there's so much to talk about. I can't wait. Oh, <laughs> don't, don't do that to us. Any, <laughs> anyway, thanks so much for spending some time with us here in the Watchtower. Where can people find you uh, out on Earth Prime? Oh my gosh, you can find me on the social medias. Uh, my handle on Instagram and Twitter is at Zara Fuzzle. And uh, you can also find me at ZaraFuzzle.com. <laughs> it's, it's <a> radio voice <laughs> I have to follow that <laughs> thanks to everyone for spending some time with us if you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files on Facebook at Crashing the Mode on Tumblr at the YJFiles.tumblr.com and on our website CrashingTheMode.com you can also find us on YouTube Stitcher and iHeartRadio if that isn't enough you can email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com if you'd like to support our show please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and our rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. If you do leave us a rating or review, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you're outside of the U.S. We have to look a little harder to find those. If you are able to support us monetarily, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even a dollar a month can help us do in-person interviews, actual play podcasts, fan meetups, discussion sessions, and more. And as always, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. Stay whelmed.